morning. I'm Lisa Malone here with a few members of the Ecclesia Wingard class, including our own Judy Evans. I love First Church, and even though I didn't grow up here, I really did. I used to spend lots of summers with my maternal grandparents who met and married here. And First Church has changed over the years to be even more inclusive. And if you're just starting to come to First Church and you haven't been spoken to, it's because we just haven't seen you because we love everybody. And it's also, we support each other. When things go wrong or things are good, we're there for each other. And I should know because I was in a really bad car accident a few years ago and the cards and the love and the support I had were absolutely wonderful. So please, if we have not spoken to you, say hello to us. We don't bite, we like to hug, but we'll just shake your hand if you're not a hugger. And we all say, Welcome to First Church! Good morning. Welcome to First Church's virtual worship stream. My name is Catherine Mullen. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Minister of Community Engagement here at First Church. And I have some announcements that I'd like to share with you this morning. Our first announcement is about our April sermon series titled, Unreasonable Hospitality. Hospitality was the foundation of the Bible's culture and is the backbone of many stories found in scripture. Being gracious, generous, and intentionally welcoming others is a priority of our faith, as well as our first church community. In this series, we will explore biblical stories, as well as the teachings of Will Gudara, author of Unreasonable Hospitality, The Power of a Genuine Welcome. And as we explore the power of delivering extraordinary hospitality, together we will learn how we can create a hospitality first approach to ministry that leaves people feeling seen and truly welcomed. So we hope you'll join us on Sundays in April to hear this sermon series. Our next announcement is about our last round of spring groups this semester. Our last round of small groups will begin this Wednesday, April 10th, and run until our last Wednesday night dinner on April 24th. In addition to our ongoing groups, our new offerings this month include yoga, writing, theology and me, which is a discussion led by Open Table surrounding affirming theology, and three one-off groups led by church members that will meet week to week. One hymn sing-along, a presentation on common medical issues for, and treatments for those 65 and older, and a session on demystifying the science and nutrition. Clearly, there are a lot of opportunities to get plugged into a small group, and we hope that you'll make plans to join us this month as we close out our spring Wednesday night dinners. Our last announcement is about our Getting to Know Us dinner on April 18th. If you've been visiting with us in First Church in recent weeks or months, you are invited to join us for our next Getting to Know Us dinner on Thursday, April 18th at 6 p.m. We will be in the large dining room eating dinner together. This is an opportunity to enjoy a meal around the table and spend time helping us get to know more about you as well as learning more about First Church. Childcare will be available with a reservation and you can click our coming up tab on our website to make this reservation. Friends, with all these announcements shared, let's greet each other in the comments and prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
I invite you to hear the words of our prayer of confession and then the words of assurance. For the times we are afraid of the stranger, for the times we refuse the stranger, because we think our resources are just too meager, Lord, forgive us. For the times we stereotype the stranger as enemy, as dangerous, as inferior somehow, Lord, forgive us. For the times we are too busy trying to impress our guests, the times we think we are being hospitable, but instead we serve only our own needs, Lord, forgive us. For the times that we miss the gift of the stranger, for the times we close our door in fear, for the times we miss your face in the other, Lord, have mercy, forgive us. Friends, God knows that in our own struggles, hurts, and brokenness, we turn inward and fail to notice the needs of another. The divine understands that sometimes in our excitement to see those whom we know, we forget to make space for those who we do not yet know. The graciousness of our creator is such that we are always lovingly reminded of the divine's wide welcome and invited to start again with hearts attuned to the inclusion of all. Have no fear, friends. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. My name is Ashley. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the minister to families and youth. Would you please take these few moments to reflect and pray with me. Lord Jesus, you teach us in the parable of the Good Samaritan that there are two kinds of people, those who bend down to help others and those who look the other way. Which kind of people will we be? We say, yes, Lord, I will love you and I will love my neighbor. But then we ask, the migrant, is she my neighbor? Those in poverty, are they my neighbors? Victims of war across the world, are they my neighbors? One who faces racism, is he my neighbor? Those disabled or elderly, are they my neighbors? But Jesus, you remind us, yes, all are our neighbors. Show us, Lord, how to love. May we open our eyes. May we emerge from our comfortable isolation. May we build a world of compassion and dignity. Lord Jesus, who was a neighbor to all, help us to preserve in love. Help us to restore dignity to the suffering and help us to build a society based not on exclusion, but on community. Would you please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Amen.
as we move into our time of offering. This morning, we are moving into a new sermon series called Unreasonable Hospitality by taking a look this week at the power of intention. This series is uh, based on a book by the same name and is written by Will Guidara, who runs 11 Madison Park in New York City. Now, this is a restaurant not only known for its delicious food, but also known for its unreasonable hospitality. One of the things he spends a lot of time talking about in his book is the way that his team spends time getting everything set perfectly and preparing ahead of every guest's arrival in their restaurant. He talks about using careful precision and grace as they set, knowing someone's name before they even walk in for their reservation, setting each and every place setting just perfectly in the same manner each and every time, making sure that each person's food arrives at the same time so that everyone at the table can enjoy a hot meal all together. And these are only scratching the surface of how they practice unreasonable hospitality. So as we were reading, we here at First Church began to ideate some ways we might also practice unreasonable hospitality. And one of those ideas was to hand out peeps to everyone who came to worship with us on Easter Sunday. You saw us put this into practice last week if you came to worship with us in person. We wanted this to serve as one of the ways that we were telling our guests and regular members that we were expecting them to arrive, that we had prepared for their visit with us by sitting down and packaging peeps into a bag, um, by having some of our members tie a beautiful ribbon on that and place a sticker to match our banners, which says Jesus loves all peeps. This was one of the ways that we decided to help people know that we were hoping they would come and join us for worship, that we were preparing for them to be here and that we were using the best of our intention to make everything ready for their arrival. Now, this gift of unreasonable hospitality didn't come without a cost. We spent just under $500 to offer our gift of peeps, an amount which we hadn't budgeted for earlier in the year, but one that we decided was absolutely worth our investment. And this is the thing about unreasonable hospitality. Sometimes it requires spending in places that we hadn't thought about before. Your generosity to this place is what will allow us to continue to think creatively, to think outside of the box about ways that we might expand our welcome and then actually put them into place. We hope you will give to First Church as a way to help all of us live more fully into the place that we want to be a place that is known for hospitality at its finest, a place that practices unreasonable hospitality, providing for our guests in a way that they were never expecting when they came to worship here. So this morning, I invite you to give so that together we might continue to grow our capacity to practice unreasonable hospitality.
I'm Stephanie York Arnold. I'm the senior pastor here at Birmingham First United Methodist Church. My pronouns are she and her. I'm so glad you're joining us. Back at the beginning of the year, I shared with our congregation a vulnerable email that I had received from a couple who had been attending First Church for many months. In the email, they expressed that despite their efforts, they simply didn't feel included or as if they fit in. Folks didn't sit with them at meals, nor included them in gatherings, and they felt that it was time for them to move along. It was a hard note to receive. And even more, it was hard to reflect upon, to name to my beloved church family, and then to strive to change. But change is what we have been working to do since receiving that note. For six weeks leading up to our church-wide retreat, we sent weekly emails with excerpts written by church members about addressing ways to be more hospitable. We encouraged folks to cross-mingle at the retreat and to get to know new people. We ordered name tags. We hosted a church-wide radical hospitality training to help us see that truly welcoming, engaging, and creating friendships with new people is key to life at First Church. Now we're beginning a three-week sermon series and a small group on the My Back Deck continuing to address together this most vital aspect of our ministry and one of our priorities, hospitality. I hope this couple learns about the impact that their email had on our ministry together. We may have gotten it wrong with them, and I deeply regret that. But we have done all I know to do to grow from that experience and to do it differently. Which, my friends, that is the meaning of the word repentance. This new sermon series is grounded in our biblical text, as hospitality takes front and center stage in many of the experiences and stories that we find within it. It also has the research and wisdom of the book entitled Unreasonable Hospitality, written by Will Gadara. An incredible book that truly we would all do well to read. This book is about the power of intentional hospitality. Will works in the number one restaurant in the world, but it all, wasn't always number one. Matter of fact, it was far from that just the year prior. Through their diligent, intentional focus, not just on having amazing food, but on service, hospitality, and exceeding people's expectations in relationships, they took dining to a whole new level. The popular Hulu drama, The Bear, is about building such a restaurant and in season two, there is an episode that is completely written off Will's book and experiences. The episode is called Forks, and it is the inspiration for this sermon series as well. But before we look into its story and wisdom, let's turn to our scripture. Second Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. Hear these words. One day, Elisha went to Shunem. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when Alicia came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant, Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her, and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. Gehazi said, she has no son, and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about the same time she gave birth to a son, 
just as Alicia had told her. In this story, an unnamed Shunammite woman models unreasonable hospitality for us. She doesn't have a prior relationship with Alicia, but she recognizes him as a holy man. She invites him to dine with her family. Following this, she realizes he may pass through town regularly, and so she discusses with her husband the idea of converting the upper part of their garage into a private room for him, fully furnished. Now, in Middle Eastern culture, showing hospitality was, in fact, expected. Bring someone in, wash their feet, feed them, offer them a place of respite, sure. But this goes above and beyond. She is treating Alicia as family. She is spending money on building a place of security for him. And it was so extravagant, he took note. It exceeded his expectations. Because of this inclusion into her family, he wanted to return the kindness and asked if he could do something for her. She said she was content. But he paid attention. He asked questions. Realizing she had no son, which meant that in that culture, she had a limited future. He promised she would have a son. And in fact, she did. Will Gadara writes in his chapter called The Extraordinary Power of Intention. He says, how do you make the people who work for you and the people you serve feel seen and valued? How do you give them a sense of belonging? How do you make them feel part of something that is bigger than themselves? How do you make them feel welcome? The Shunammite woman made Alicia feel seen and valued from the beginning. She created an intentional way to help him feel he belonged to her family. He belonged to their community. Being seen and valued truly does make all the difference. Years ago, when my family was leaving Disney World with our kids, who at the time were three and four years old, a park worker noticed us. Our daughter Georgia was carrying a new set of Tinkerbell toys in her hand, and someone approached her and asked her if she liked princesses. Of course, she said yes. And the next thing we know, we were whisked away into a building and brought into a beautifully appointed room. To our surprise, we then had a private appointment with Princess Belle and Princess Snow White. Now, the kids thought that was pretty awesome, but my mom and I were practically crying as we stood to the side because it made us feel so special. How did that happen? But hospitality isn't just about crazy moments like that. Recently, at Lifetime Fitness, my trainer noticed that I had missed a few classes, and she decided to ask me about it. When I mentioned that my daughter had had surgery, she inquired a little more. I explained that we had recently found out that our daughter had endometriosis, to which she then replied to me that was her husband's specialty at UAB. After class, she said she'd give me his number if I wanted to call and set up an appointment. When she did, she didn't give me his office number as I expected. She gave me her husband's cell phone number, and then she said she would tell him to expect a call from me. Because she saw me, and my concern when she didn't have to. We now have an appointment in mid-May for our daughter. Feeling seen and valued and as though you matter is what our human hearts crave. So when we accidentally miss the mark, it leaves an impact that isn't easily undone. Will Gadara goes on to explain that this kind of unreasonable hospitality, it doesn't just happen, it takes intentionality. Intention means every decision from the most obviously significant to the seemingly mundane matters. To do something with intentionality means to do it thoughtfully, with clear purpose, with an eye always on the desired result. The Shunammite woman wanted Alicia to feel safe and welcomed in her home. She was intentional about making space for him down to the lamp and the side table and the fresh bed linens. We're called in our practice of life and ministry together to take that same intentionality and put it to work, welcoming those who are looking for belonging. 
At our radical hospitality training, Reverend Cheryl Thornton shared a handout that in part said, no assignment in the church is more one-on-one than the ministry of greeters. The foyer is their chapel, the information desk, their pulpit, the walk around spaces, their parish. Church greeters have a one another ministry, face to face, hand to hand, heart to heart with the people that they're called to serve. We want from the moment people arrive and park on our campus for them to experience the gift of our genuine hospitality and welcome. We want not to point people to where they're looking to go, but we want to walk them to that location. We want to shepherd them to the nursery or their Sunday school classes. We want someone in a class to greet a new person, to sit with them, to invite them to join them in a worship service following Sunday school, and then to follow up with an invitation to lunch, coffee, Wednesday night dinner, or simply to just join them again next week to sit in the pew or the chair. We want a church family that emails their pastors and staff after meeting new folks and shares about them so that we too get to learn who was here. We want small groups and Sunday school classes intentionally noticing who's missed several Sundays or Wednesday nights and then following up with them and then letting the staff know about those absences or needs. We want folks listening out for ways our church can step into the gap and make a difference in people's lives. In the episode Forks, as well as in the book, we learned that the number one restaurant in the world has staff positions dedicated to listening out for the desires and wishes of their guests. They're called dream weavers. They literally check social media accounts of those who have reservations to learn about them. What special touches might make their night out of this world when they come dine with them? They've been known to pay customers parking meters when meals run long, to drop off bottles of champagne and chocolate-covered strawberries at guest homes for anniversaries, to refuse guests paying for their meals. And my favorite, one time upon hearing a family who had traveled to New York for the first time was about to fly home, they bemoaned at their table they had tried all this great food, but they had never had a street vendor hot dog. So the restaurant had a dream weaver run to the nearest stand bring back hot dogs to the kitchen, they had their chef plate them, and then they served them free of charge to the table. They were astonished at the attention to detail and the intentional effort to make their trip amazing and complete. I had just read that chapter several weeks ago when new guests came to First Church, and I met a young boy who I was taking to Sunday school who told me he loved geology and rocks. Upon hearing that, I realized I had a bunch of gemstones in my office, and I ran over and brought them all to his class. That day, he and all the other children in Sunday school took home their favorite colored gemstone because I was intentionally trying to live out this example of unreasonable hospitality. I learned something he loved, and I had access to it. So it only took me a few minutes to intentionally decide that surprising him and giving him some joy was in fact my priority that morning. And the truth is, that exchange did more for me than it did him. It made my day to make his Sunday morning. Friends, I share all of this with you because if you have chosen to be a member here at First Church, or just to be here regularly and make this your home, then we are all called to practice the extraordinary power of intentionality and to be dream weavers. When we step foot on campus, we show each and all by looking for ways that we can, like the Shunanite woman, radically live out our faith and welcome others. We should be looking for who's new always. We should make a point to intentionally strive to incorporate them into the life of this church, to include them in our friend group. How can we help them feel seen and valued and know the truth that they belong? That should be the question on our heart. I promise you, if we strive together to do this, we will not feel left out. Just as the Shunammite woman was not left out, instead she was incorporated into a larger, wider family. In community, she blessed others and found herself receiving blessing too. Blessing that changed her life for the good. 
And that's the way belonging works. It's reciprocal. And it's what we all need more of. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. At this time, I'd like to invite you into our affirmation of faith. And we can join our voices together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you are a child of the God of love, and you belong to a community, a family of faith here at First Church that radically wants to welcome and include others. So as you go about your week, 
May you look for those who are in need of belonging. May you offer out a sense of welcome and hospitality that exceeds their expectations. May you invite them into your life and into our church family. May you create that reciprocal relationship where all are welcome, all belong. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, Alleluia. Amen. Thank you.